It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you all for having me. And it's coming to India is such a an energizing influence on 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 me when I visit here because India feels like a country that's so right so 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 has changed in its DNA and the energy and growth here is such a such an exciting contrast to some of the things that I see where I come from in the UK. I think change is a fascinating subject and it's something that I think about in two ways. One in my writing, in my book, The Imagination Muscle, and how we must always strive to change and how change comes from us, but it also happens to us. And I'll, I'll talk about that some more. And then I have another aspect of change that I think about in my, in my business life, where I've been running a company with 500 people in the UK and many offices around the world, including in Mumbai, um, where we are in the cre world of creativity. These are, this is a pu publishing company that publishes titles like Vogue and GQ and Condé Nast Traveler and Architectural Digest. And ideas are central to the success of a creative business. And, and in my role as a, as a manager, I've always wanted to instill the expectation of ideas and evolution and to, to make ideas something that happen in a, in a safe space where people can take risks and people can suggest things that may change the way we operate, may, small changes, big changes, but nonetheless, never standing still. The, the, the media world is changing as much as anything, and over the last 10 years has been disrupted very dramatically by the internet, by the digital space, and really the changes that I see in the world around us are many, in many cases invisible changes to the outside world. They're changes in bits, not in atoms. So I think very carefully about how we adapt as a media business, how we have adapted to the internet, to social media, to video, to long form video, short form video, and all these things require a mindset which is not afraid of, of having new ideas and having, and, and having a culture of change. And really, the, the, the difficulty and the challenge for somebody in a position of leadership, especially when you've been doing the job for a long time and when you've got to the position you're in by, you think, being right most of the time, you have to, you have to not allow your ego to get in the way. You have to allow yourself to, to, to think to yourself, I could be wrong. And I often find myself, people, people might suggest an idea, and I would say, well, we tried that idea five years ago, and it didn't work. But now I stop myself and think, maybe it didn't work five years ago, but now it could work. So I've got to be able to pull back from my own view and realize the world is changing around me, and I have to change with it and have the open-mindedness to, 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 to absorb other people's views. And I think the best leaders of today are not people who sit in their offices and think, I'm always right. They're people who develop the networks of people around them who can challenge their thoughts, who can bring in new ideas, who can have a, have a different approach to life and, can, and can, can make your company, your organization, whatever it may be, think afresh about, about what it is doing and how it does it. I think the, the, the hallmark of a civilized, intelligent person is to be able to imagine that they are wrong. And that is something you've got to keep throughout your life. So, thank you, thank you. I hope you are able to hear me. Yeah. Thank you so much. We shall be again coming to Albert talking about his book, Imagination Muscle, and the uh, Red has talk about like uh, the ego part. Media people have ego. How to diminish it? So now I am coming to Deva Shish here, principal of the College School, education expert here. An ego thing has been raised by uh, uh, Albert here. And uh, Devashish, you are now, uh, you are giving education to children here. What type of future, if any kid is taking admission in 2024, and when it comes out of school in 2040, maybe schools and graduation done in 2047, 2050, how do you visualize this education future here? And then what you should do with the ego part also? Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kalia. It's a, a privilege to be here with this panel. Um, I can't visualize 2040. Uh, 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 I think that is a domain uh, not where education really 
uh, you know, thrives in education. Uh, as an educationist who is dealing with K to 12 students, you know, my daily worry is how do I put these grand theories into practice so that the children, when they really graduate in 2048 or when about 2039, if they join me today in nursery, uh, how they look at the world. You know, from a child's perspective, uh, I find the old adage which has been ascribed to many uh, great authors, uh, the most daunting one is, is, is that schooling actually kills imagination. Uh, I mean, Mark Twain said it and so many others said it before. Now, how do I save a child from that? Uh, as, a, as a head of a school, that is one enormous responsibility. Every time I hear of imagination, my mind as a teacher calibrates, so how do I bring imagination, make, how do I make it alive for a child? Now, uh, when we are talking about exponential change, the only way perhaps you meet change head on is when you have your faculties of imagination, I mean what Albert calls the imagination muscle, really flexed and you have the ability to flex it. And Albert put it very rightly, even Ron Richard talks about it, that the point of learning is uh, at the point of risk. Unless you are out of your zone of comfort, you're not really learning, you're not really being creative. Um, but when, when are you really taking that step? Uh, if you ask that question now, that leap of faith happens in a two-fold space, right? You take a leap of faith when there's a gun to your head, but that's a survival leap. That's not when imagination is really working. You take a leap of faith when you are, ironically, in a safe space, in a place of safety, in a place of empathy, in a place where well-being is paramount. Now, um, I think as a school, one of the things which uh, we really need to start worrying about is is the school space safe? Not physical safety. I think all of us are very aware that all our schools are physically rather safe. But it's a safe place for taking the imaginative leap. Am I allowed to tinker? Am I allowed to do what I want? Or am I being tested and the test is an existential question if I am good or not? You know, every examination in mathematics which is out of 100, the moment I get to 50, I'm worried. Am I carrying my parents' ambitions on my shoulder well enough. So I'm not alone in my educational journey. I'm saddled with so many expectations and that's not a safe space for a child to be in. So for safety to happen, I think an empathetic safe space is most critical for a child in terms of education and that is when creativity can really uh, make its mark. So as far as uh, I see education, I think it is the core responsibility of educators and administrators to uh, work in a space where collaboration thrives, where safety thrives, where well-being allows us or allows a child to be, uh, you know, to take the risk where learning happens. And unless and until we make this space inclusive from the point of be, uh, view of ability and even aspects like gender, you know, it's so critical to have this inclusive space. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I, just, uh, uh, I just heard, uh, I just read something by Adam Grant who said that the 21st century learner, uh, the key skill is agility more than ability. Now agility most certainly perhaps would come after ability, right? Unless I make the child able, how would I engage the, how would I, you know, create a space for the child to be agile. And for that ability to thrive, I think an inclusive space, a space where gender as a construct is not thrust upon you, a place where ability as a construct is not thrust upon you, and a place where ambition again as a construct is not thrust upon you. And that is a space where a child will perhaps thrive with creativity in. Fantastic, fantastic. Now uh, we are turning towards Koel. She is an actor, producer, and she is from a different field, performing arts. I think when any butterfly is flying, like uh, flying here, or maybe any colorful thing, flowers here, the we, as a hard-nosed people see it, she sees it slightly differently here. 
So she will be talking about the change in her own domain. And that change can be poetic change also. So she's from the performing arts field here. So Koel, it's your turn. Thank you. I mean, honestly, I have to say I was a little baffled when I was invited uh, to speak on this panel and a little bit scared. Firstly, because of the panelists. Secondly, because of the topic. And then I realized that this was just my imposter syndrome speaking. And this is why I believe that although the world has experienced exponential change, that change is not felt equally across the genders. I mean, I have as much right to be here as all these accomplished men. I'm a TV personality for the last two decades. I've acted in films. I'm a published uh, writer. Um, I have enough success under my belt. Or even now that we're talking about you know, giving uh, ambition, leaving it out as a construct. So forget ambition. I have as much right to be here. But the need to publicly prove myself yet again has not changed. And that for me is definitely a construct, as you talk about, of gender, of, um, uh, you know, for us innovators, um, women innovators or women disruptors, definitely equal troublemakers. Imagine Elon Musk if he was Elena Musk. Do you think that he, she would be allowed to get away with the kind of disruption, unilateral decisions that he has bulldozed through as successfully. She would be dismissed by her own board before she could even propose an iota of such change. So change is not felt universally. First, I'd like to come to that, that there is exponential change. Yes, for professionally, as a TV person, I can say I have gone from analog to digital. And that change, just to understand it physically, means that we used to shoot on umatic tapes. Umatic tapes are bigger than that. They are this big. So imagine the camera. The camera used to be that big. We used to shoot on that. If, if you had to edit, you had to do several paper edits before you can even go into the editing room because you would have generational loss. Now you can shoot on something as small as a thumbnail and it can be broadcast quality. So professionally, yes, I have seen the change. Personally, I'm still sitting here and wondering should I be on this panel or not? Will I have something worthy to say or not? Why should I have to think that? Only because I'm a woman. But why do women, why do us women, we thrive, survive in this world of exponential change is because A, we are more adaptable, 100%. We are more used to pain and uh, survival for us is not a question of choice. There are way too many people depending on us to survive. And most importantly, because we depend on a sisterhood. The best of us, we find, we stalk, and we create uh, a sisterhood of like-minded women who take on your causes like they were their own causes. And this sisterhood helps us thrive in this world. Unfortunately, this sisterhood still comes up against, for want of a better word, a boys club. And the boys club thrives on maintaining the status quo. They might be out there propo proposing and working for and championing exponential change in the world and innovation, but when it comes to gender equality, they want the status quo. And as sisterhood, us women, we're pushing for that change. So let's talk about it more. Um, I talk about it in my book, which is a fictional piece, which deals with four women who are out of the depth, who have basically taken on a whole new challenge of change by leaving the world that they know behind and being foreign in Paris. The name suggests it, invisible in Paris. And they survive because of this odd sisterhood. And that's me, I leave it for you guys to thank take you, it. Thank you, thank you, Koel, thank you. She has written invisible in Paris, but here she is very visible to us. <laughs> you can't be invisible there. So now, uh, Mr. Myra said that he will be speaking last here. Okay, so uh, I am now going to young adult expert, Mr. Amit Sen here. Okay, and Amit Sen is going to talk about children, young adult, what problems they are facing individually, collectively, and how to adapt. Amit, your turn. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, discussion up to now has been so stimulating and from different perspectives. Uh, yes, indeed, because I work with children and the youth, I will take a developmental lens. And um, just to understand how um, change happens within, at an individual level, like right from the, uh, from the time babies are born. In fact, perhaps even before that, um, right up to young adulthood, this rapid change, this uh, exponential change in their brains and their minds and their bodies, um, in, uh, in the way they socialize, in the way they grow up emotionally, all of that happens, right? And for that to happen in a healthy manner where they can take their chances, take the risks to be able to explore the world, they need an environment which is safe, which is predictable, um, which is uh, full of rhythms and rituals and routines. Indeed, uh, we know very well now, especially after the pandemic, how uh, the routines and rhythms of school life, of holidays, of predictability in our world affects children's growth and development. So that's, that's absolutely key. It's crucial. And of course, the relationships that they form with their parents, with other people, the attachment, and that also centers them, it grounds them. It makes them feel adequate to be able to take those chances and do things creatively. And as we go along in this uh, journey, during adolescence, of course, there's a bit of a tug of war because adolescents are trying their best to actually break away from the family mold and, and some of the key things that they've learned over the years, they want to challenge it, etc. And yet, paradoxically, that's the time they require the safety and the stability the most, you know, yeah? And then comes adulthood, and we assume that once we have become adults, we are now stable enough within. The, so the stability that we require in the environment in ideal situations should have gone within. And if the stability is within, then if there's chaos and unpredictability in the world outside, we assume that we'll be able to handle it because we'll be stable inside, won't we, right? However, the question is to what extent? And to answer that, I'm going to take from my experience of working with children and families during the pandemic, right? And the pandemic actually brought a reality which was unprecedented. It shook our world like how? And of course, it affected children and adolescents in profound ways, but it also affected adults because there was no certainty about anything at all. And there was palpable fear and anxiety about death, about losses, losing your job, about losing connections. So there was a breakdown of daily routines. There was a breakdown of institutions of all kinds, school, colleges, offices, uh, transport. in symptoms of anxiety, depression, substance misuse, uh, and indeed uh, deliberate self-harm and suicide. It is, I mean, it's shocked us in the way it's grown in this time. And I don't think we've recovered completely from it. So how do we bring back, and of course, during this process, what we have, the other thing we have lost is a sense of meaning and purpose. And I've seen that happen in collectives, in, you know, in, in individuals. So the big question in my mind is that, of course, the world is changing, and it's changed dramatically both due to the digital world and also because of how, many, how we've been hit by the pandemic, questioning everything that we had taken for granted earlier. So what do we need to do to be able to stabilize us, ourselves? Let's start with adults now, inside, so that we, we are able to deal with the chaos outside. So I'll, I'll leave you with that question, and we might be able to readdress it when we come back. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Now we are coming to Mr. Bayra, <clears throat> member of Planning Commission. We saw to it that India became the third largest economy in the world. And then uh, as a chairman of BCG, I think you advise, I think, most of the brainy corporate leader here. And the moment our intellectual muscle goes up, we become averse to change and advises also. But you advise them, sir, successfully. Okay. And now you are chairman, help is international also. So elderly perspective is there also. So it is you, Mr. Myra here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful uh, uh, group to be with in this conversation about uh, one side, if you set it up, it's about uh, uh, change is the only constant. Okay. Uh, 
Change is the only constant. Thank you, Sanjay. Change is the only constant. I've been a consultant okay, for many, many years, a uh, consultant to companies in America. I lived and was a consultant there for 10 years, a consultant there for uh, 10 years, um, before I became BCG chairman and then here, where I concentrated much more on Indian companies later. And I found that uh, when I was a consultant in America, I wasn't a consultant to any industry. I had clients who were in the media industry. They were undergoing great change. They couldn't predict because of technology um, what their industry would look like. I was a consultant to manufacturing companies and because of automation and competition from other countries, American companies couldn't predict what their industry would look like. I was a consultant to the healthcare industry and they couldn't predict because of new discoveries of medicine, how could we de deliver what it would look like. And of course, the hospitality and retail industries going through change. The constant thing with all of them was, they were all facing changes at a faster pace than their industries had ever experienced before. So what would be the one thing that they would need to master? Uh, it was this, that they would have to be faster learners faster learners than any potential competition because the competition could come from another industry. Yeah? If the person in the IT industry is changing faster, he'll soon start to encroach your media industry and you'll wonder whether the, it's a media company or vice versa. So for yourself in an uncertain world as a company and for yourself, be the fastest learner. And that comes to then linking the stages of life. As a child, and then as an adult, which is most of our lives. Uh, and then finally, when you say, what was all this about? I've retired. So I'm going to connect from the child to myself at uh, well past the official retirement age, but working with older people. You know, uh, uh, in child psychology, Eric Erickson, he talks about the stages. He puts eight of them. But I'm saying they're phases. There's a phase of when you're a child. Then there's a phase during which you're an adult and expected to perform and deliver, which is a long phase. Uh, you have midlife crisis sometime in between and wonder why you're doing what you're doing. But you retire, and then you have the time to go off into the mountain and say, uh, old philosophies, discover now who you are, finally. It should be right at the beginning. And children actually, children actually are the most curious in stages of life. And I want to talk about curiosity is what you've got to keep alive through life. A child is very curious. A child wants to just figure out why is this thing here? And if I put this thing together with that, like my daughter did, orange pips, if I put them up my nose, <laughs> what will it feel like? And we say, it's dangerous, you know, and say, that's why you have to manage a child. They might hurt themselves in their process of learning. And you tell them, asani karna, asani karna. We've grown up and we know, so do it the way we tell you to do it, then you'll be safe. But this learning is killed thereafter. The whole education system is putting into people what they must learn to do efficiently, effectively, and as I'm saying, save themselves from having to learn anything more. <laughs> because it's already taught to you and it's given there. So we have spent a very long time of our lives just killing our own curiosity. So coming back to the companies, I found that, uh, you know, we talk of pedagogy, which is how children learn and through education. The big problem was andragogy. How do adults learn? And for adults, the most important thing is the first unlearn. And that unlearning is, Elon Musk, you're talking about very well, that, you know, if something has produced this success for me, I better do more of it. Because that's what's required and that's what I know. And that's the time you have to say no, if you're humble, to say, Actually, it should be now something else. Hmm? But will I be learning something else or keep on showing off that I'm the, the best? And the poor man is having a lot of difficulty right now, Elon Musk, in that regard. Right? So in our Indian traditions also, we have the grastas, yeah, four of them. And it goes to the same. I say that a child is curious and you need to be, this is my learning for myself through life, that if you wish to be 
living a life, and as I say, my mother used to say to me that she doesn't want, she died at 97, passed away at 97, that I, that, for 10 years before that, you children are trying to take care of me and make sure I'm safe and all. Please, I don't want to add more years to my life. I want to add more life to my years. And she said, I live when I'm learning, and I learn when I'm curious. I learn when I'm curious. So a child and ourselves, be curious about the world. Why is the world like this? And our whole traditions, and you, you know, you may come to that, um, in the Rig Veda, it says, I mean, thousands of years before uh, science was invented, and he says, we know who wrote it in the Rig Veda, it says, I don't know how the universe was created and who created it. Hmm? I don't know that. I don't even know whether he who created it knows that either. <laughs> yes, so we don't know that. Sorry, hmm. sorry, sorry. I'm so busy chatting with my <laughs> colleagues that I forget. I'm sorry we are conversing together. I hope you didn't uh, uh, bother you. So here we are. Be curious. Be curious about how the world is working. And if the world is not producing, what you think the world should produce for yourself and for others. And I want to make this distinction. If all the time you want to change the world to make it good for you, rather than I want to help to change the world to make it good for others. That humility and the desire, the Gandhiji's Anantodiyai, as a policy maker, and I'm saying as a corporate leader, your judge of your policy and your, uh, your actions should be what good is it going to do to the humblest, least powerful person I can see? And that's why I come to women. And I see that thinking about girl children and how they are going to grow up, powerless. And they're the most creative. A girl is the most creative. Thank you. So, of course. <laughs> I mean, you're born naturally to be creative. We men are destroyers. We destroy creativity by saying we are certain and you do it like this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am coming again to Mr. Reed here and he has written a book Imagination Muscle here. That means he has said that imagination muscle is a faculty. It's an, it's an ordinary faculty as you have hands, lamps, etc. Use it here. So I am getting curious about like what are his detailed view about this imagination muscle here plus also he says something is changing something something is not changing also so yes Peter, this, uh, so, many, so many things i wanted to say here so many ideas provoked by the my fellow panelists i the, the, the way i see imagination is we take care of our physical health and we pay attention increasingly to our mental health to our emotional well-being but we don't pay attention to our imaginative health and for me the imagination is the highest gift of, of, of mankind, of humankind. And it, we, have, we all have the gift of imagination if we choose to use it. And if we choose to put in systems where we, 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 we use it in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a regular fashion. So for me, imagination is the, is the highest form of human activity. And th there are a couple of points I want to come back on which, which have been raised by my fellow panelists. I mean, the, the, to me, it feels like we're talking about change in two areas of life, in the early stages of education and then in the mature later years of our lives. And I think the two are equally important. And for me, the education system that I witness in, in the UK, where I come from, is hopelessly equipped to, to teach our children to be imaginative. And in some ways, as we were discussing earlier, it, take, it drives the imagination out of children. And we're trained from a very early age, from 15 or 16, to specialize in certain subjects, and we become experts in our niche. We become great, great, um, uh, we, we, we know a lot about a little. And this is very different to the way that people used to be educated. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, people would have a much wider range of, of education, and you'd have people who naturally went from the sciences to the literature and arts. I mean, there's an, to give you an example, um, Humphrey Davy, who was a, was a famous chemist in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom in the, in the 19th century, he invented the arc lamp, the first electrical arc lamp. He was also the editor of this famous book of poetry by Wordsworth and Coleridge, the lyrical ballads. So here we have somebody who went effortlessly from one field to another. And that, 
in, in our country at least, is inconceivable today that somebody could be so distinguished from one area and, and then so distinguished in another. Would be vanishingly rare. And the other point I want to make is about the subject really that we were talking about, the, the, this idea of staying fresh. And f what I write about in my book is cultivating the beginner's mindset. We, 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 we had this idea of, of there's a, well, let me tell you about a fascinating piece of research that was done, which I quote in my book, which, which goes into the, in the, the Nobel Prize, with the scientists who win Nobel Prizes in history have tended to be scientists who also had a disproportionate interest in the arts. So if you take, I mean, Isaac Newton was a painter and a poet. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm referring to pe people from the world I come from in, 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 the, in, in the Europe and, and the US. The, uh, Isaac Newton was a painter and a poet. Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, who won the Nobel Prize in 1945, was also a, a, a proficient artist and a member of the Chelsea Arts Club. And Richard Feynman, the physicist from the States, was also an artist, and he saw art as a way of expressing the beauty of the universe and the world that we, we live in. And the point that I draw from this, and one finds in other areas of life, is that if you retain, as you get older in life, as you go on in life, if you retain the beginner's mindset, if you're starting out at something new over here, that opens up synaptic pathways in your mind which allow you to be fresh and strong at the job you, you, you do in, your, in your, your day job, as it were. And for me, that is a very important lesson to take through life. Be a beginner at something. Take a risk and do something new, because that will make you open. It'll make you more susceptible to having ideas for change and more, 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 uh, more of a fresh perception on the world, rather than growing stale and enclosed in the, in the education you had in your teens and early 20s. That, for me, is, is a very important part of being alive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, coming again to Quail, <clears throat> and we are talking about your debut book, like uh, celebrations of contradictions, like you have used these words. And then one phrase is also there in the book. You're talking about the Paris, the and, uh, invisible in Paris here, that they belong to the city that is insistent on alienating them. OK, one question is here. You are from the field of the performing arts, and you are describing reality. Where is the imagination? Where is the imagination? Imagination, imagination is always uh, very, very positive. But here it is the reality. You know, I'd like to take on something before what we were talking about, this unlearning and how our education system is really failing us. Being a mother to a young child, this is something, pedagogy is something which is a pet peeve in our lives at the moment, you know. Where, how are we educating our children? We don't have any other options. Either you become the person who is, you know, going around the world on a boat, educating them with life lessons and giving into curiosity and imagination and all that, or, but then you're, you're a kind of renegade and like, you know, different from life, or you stick to whatever is available. And from that, what really, while you were talking, it, it, it struck me that we assume change is a good thing. Why should we, on this panel, we're all talking about, oh, exponential change. For a second, even in my field and in everyone's field, if AI comes in with the way that it's promising to come in, it ain't a good thing. I don't want someone else writing my book, like a computer writing my book. I don't want scripts, and some of the AI scripts are really not bad. I've, I've, I've read, you know, you give your <laughs> prompts, and they come in, and they're quite fabulous. Why aren't we, this whole question of curiosity, of imagination, of unlearning, Let's get our children, let's get us to question the very fact that just because we're saying it's change doesn't mean it's a good thing. Let's first start with that, that not all change is a good thing. Sorry, I totally diverted from the point that you were trying to make. But I, I, I really um, am very moved by the fact that we have educationists here talking about you know, schools are destroying our children's brains. <laughs> and this is, this is a worried mother speaking. Yes, I see this. I see the beauty of my child who's so curious about everything of why did you put an orange thing up your nose to now going, I mustn't do it because that's not the correct thing to do. <laughs> so it brings me back to just a whole lot of questions without answers, but that's not a bad thing. Let's learn to question things permanently. Let's trigger our imagination. Fantastic. Devashish, you want to comment on that? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, while Quill and Albert were speaking, I was also musing a bit because, you know, uh, uh, we are bound by so many taxonomies in our lives. You know, we analyze things through taxonomies. So I was thinking of Maslow's and Bloom's. Now, Maslow's hierarchy of needs basically says that, you know, uh, at the basic level, you are looking at safety and security and all those things. Now, the education system that we have been, we have inherited is a product of the Industrial Revolution, you know, where little boxes were being created uh, out of a factory-like situation. Now, little boxes were being created because you needed labors and clerks to run the system. Um, however, I mean, this panel and the festival is a, you know, uh, is evidence to the fact that the empire has begun writing back long back, right? And creativity is now something which we have started taking for granted, and that is higher uh, level of blooms. Now, higher when you were at the lower level of Maslow's, the what in education was sufficient. You had to know about what because you had to know about his master's voice and repeat it. But now that we have climbed the ladder in a taxonomical scale of, say, Maslow, and we are looking at creativity and sustainability at that level, why are we refusing to climb up the Bloom's ladder and challenge GPT with creativity? You know, chat GPT just aggregates data. And that aggregation, in some combination, sounds sometimes fascinating, right? But the point is, if we can actually teach and educate our children to keep that imagination muscle alive and the curiosity bone alive, I think that's where the answer at school level and university level to changes like chat GPT, which might seem daunting. And But for that, you need that safe space. You need to thrive. You need to allow the child to thrive with that orange paper up your nose. This is, this is, this is your, yeah? the college school philosophy. That's good. So now I think uh, we are running short of time, although we want to uh, listen to uh, uh, Amit ji also, Arun ji also. But now the time has started for question answer session here. We have exactly 10 minutes. And uh, the persons who can give the mic, please, please help here. And yes, please help her. She wants to ask question. Uh, mostly I was very curious. Both of you have a publishing background. Her sister is in one of India's largest publishing groups. That's India Today. You are from Condenas. I was at Hello Magazine 13 years. And I think it was the biggest, the biggest gift that the universe could have given me as a writer. Because we were accessing minds from every walk of life in, in a celebrity realm. So the question I have is, what are some of the game changers in your industry that you think uh, will probably require teenagers and puts maybe uh, you know young school kids to come in maybe and say hey try this and do that and do that um, right now I think the biggest thing uh, advantage an adult can have is a child in your life because a child is so on the change curve like it would take us so much longer to move along that curve so that's the question I have are there some really strategic shifts that you've seen that all of us can adapt at a conceptual level in life to survive. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound alarmist, but you know, when you say what is the most exponential change that we have seen in our industry, well, it's the internet, isn't it? It is, uh, it is how fast that has moved. And some of it is fabulous for the way that it's connected the world, the way that it's educating our rural places, the way it's educating, uh, you know, bringing the world alive to developmentally challenged places, to difficult to reach places, but at the same time, and this is where I don't want to sound alarmist, it is a very scary world. It's a very scary world to have as a preteen girl with the world that we live in where everything is accessible. We've just had Mark Zuckerberg apologizing to parents um, uh, in the Congress, uh, you know, for exactly that reason that they weren't careful enough. I think it's the internet that has been the biggest um, but it comes back to that point, change must be used wisely. Change as a construct, change just as a uh, given is not, is not just as a whole a good thing. That's where human uh, intelligence, curiosity, imagination, all the things that we're talking about has to come into play for change to be used in a way that's constructive. I think the role of um, um, social media in its influence on the imagination, on people's ability to have ideas, is profound and often negative. It's, it, it, 
I mean, the internet, the World Wide Web, the, the social media is a wonderful tool for discovery. But in my view, it's also a, a, a limiting factor on people's, people's courage to take risks, to, to, to risk a new idea, to try something a bit different. Because the moment you do that, you're immediately judged by invisible people, hordes of people on, the, on, on, on Twitter, on where, where, Facebook, wherever it is. And so the natural inclination is to revert to the norm, to become part of a tribe, to become part of a group, and to express yourself through a set of ideas that that group possesses, and not to stray from that group. And I think that is very limiting, and I think that's very damaging. And if I was a young person today, I would wonder, why would I risk having a new idea? What's, what's in it for me? What, the downside is so much greater than the upside. That, that for me, is, is the great problem with social media. Equally, social media, the internet, is a wonderful tool for discovery. And if it's used correctly, it's, it comes back to your point, if, the, if these things are used correctly, then, then that they have a, a, an enormous power to do good. And when it comes to traditional media players, like Conan Ast or Hearst or India Today, they have a... They have a very important position, in my view, to, 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 to hold the line on, on, on authority, on well-researched articles, on truth, on, on, on accurate reporting. Their, their, their value, for me, to me, is greater than ever, and their importance to society is greater than ever. Any other question? Yes. So my question is from uh, Devashi, sir. As an educationist, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, the topic of this uh, uh, session is navigating the change. And moral values play a very important role uh, uh, for the children. So can you tell me what are the values that we can uh, teach the students which can help in actually navigating the change? Um, uh, it's a it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, teaching values, uh, uh, abstraction over abstraction. So uh, uh, I'll take off from what uh, Albert was just talking about. You know, I think the toughest uh, deal in a social media is the like button. And that like button traps you in, um, in kind of echo chambers of thoughts. And that is when risk taking takes flight. Uh, value education is about, it's an abstraction, right? So. Whatever education you give, whether it is value loaded or value negative, the child will have to have that space of experimentation and playing around with that value. And unless we allo allocate and allow the child to play around with that value system, uh, you know, all value system across religions, earlier religions used to take the uh, onus of uh, imparting values. You know, that is where temples, churches, families, all these systems came into place. Society played the educator of value system. But today when we are looking at schools as value system educators, you know, it's a far difficult challenge because, you know, how do you decide what values to actually impart to a child? Can Who I decides respond to that? that? So you'll have to take partnership with the parents. You'll have to allow the child to actually experiment with the system and learn from their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, their own mistakes to a large extent. But coming to value education, I think some values are fundamental to life. And those values are cherished in, across all our cultures. Uh, right to life, you right can, to opinion, can. right can to I, uh, Can I jump in also, Debashish? Yes. I can see run, uh, time yes. running out because yes. this is something that we deal with all the time in mental health as well and holistic development of children. A uh, lot of discussion has happened about school and the uh, warped education system, isn't it? I think giving children values is, comes from a very hierarchical, oppressive system of schooling that we have developed over generations. And rather than give them values, it's important to open it up for discussion, to listen to them, to, again, evoke their curiosity, imagination, l learn from their lived experience, and challenge some of the values that we have. You know, uh, we have been handed down. Because these values haven't worked for us. Have they? I mean, in the large majority of people, I mean, the, whether you talk about schooling or education, uh, most of us here probably will look back, uh, a, a, you know, um, um, into those years and think about what went wrong rather than what went right, isn't it? So I, I think that space, that emotionally safe space to be able to question without the adult ego getting bruised, right, to be able to have the humility and the 
uh, openness to be able to embrace <laughs> children and asking questions and, uh, uh, and, and co-constructing the values that we have with them. It's time that children and women had a much bigger say in how life should be and what okay. values we should follow. Okay, okay. okay. Sir, so we have one and a half minute. Last question. Yeah, sir, my question is, uh, the purpose of uh, education essentially should be to create a better human being, which is um, being mis uh, it is missing almost all across the globe. And uh, we talked about creativity and said that education is the byproduct of the demand of the industries. So how we, we can envision a new education system in the changing world? My question to the panel. Can I just uh, take further? This was a question that uh, you're right. We talked about education. Education has become a system to produce workers for companies and the economy. Okay, so as your question was put, what do they need? And they don't know actually, but it's uncertain. So they specify things that they think they will need, and then you person spends a young person, you know, five, ten years specializing in something, and then they end up by saying, no one wants me. So in India, the highest unemployment is with the highest educated people, because they spent the longest time being educated for things which are no longer required in that those numbers. So we change it all together, I come back to, if children from the beginning are encouraged to do what they do and we don't know how to do, is remain curious and keep thinking about what you want to do and why and keep on with that question through life, then doesn't matter what is changing around yourself. Pardon.